just wanted to give a brief intro kind of, especially for those who are new to, to She Says. I, I'm super grateful for both of our panelists who are, I think, first, first time listeners, first time callers um, into She Says Boston. Um, so She Says uh, started about 10 years ago um, by two amazing women. And, um, you know, like many stories that you've heard before, they're pretty much tired of being the only um, in every scenario that they were in. So whether that was a panel or a jury or a room where it happened. Um, and so they decided to create uh, this, this group really targeted at, at networking for women, knowing that that was such a barrier, especially um, for women to come together. Um, it started in New York and London. And the, since then we've grown to, I think over 55 cities around the globe. We've got you know um, everything from presence in Singapore. Uh, we've got Stockholm, Cape Town was, a, was an event that was earlier today. Um, and then of course, Boston is one of the most um, recent additions, which was super exciting. We launched last fall. Um, but the, the, the one thing that all the groups kind of share is this idea of bringing women together around conversations that are important and bringing diverse voices together um, to talk about them. So the, the one kind of rule is that the panel is always exclusively women. Um, most of the people that attend are often women too, but we welcome all, all folks to the conversation. Um, so if you have signed up, you'll kind of know the organization, but feel free to follow us on our newly launched Instagram channel, uh, which is at she says BOS. Um, and obviously if you've registered through Eventbrite, we've got your email, so we'll be sure to keep you in the loop for the next um, few events. Um, and I, as I've mentioned to both of our panelists today, you know, this is a meant, to be, meant to be a conversation, so feel free to have your video on, and, you know, have new, new pets, have, have, have beverages, do whatever you need to do, because we really want this to be more, much more of a fireside chat than a presentation. I think, especially with this topic, it's, it's going to be just an ongoing conversation for a, for a, a long time and, and until, you know, well, until we don't need to have the conversation anymore. So again, more than ever, really want to make sure this feels um, conversational, approachable, and as we're chatting, feel free to drop questions in the chat. Um, Austin uh, will be kind of monitoring the chat to make sure we don't lose any questions. And then we'll definitely save some time at the end for Q&A um, throughout. Um, but without further ado, I would love to um, introduce our two great panelists. And because they are so uh, have so much great experience, I won't try to butcher it and I will let them introduce themselves. Um, so we'll start with Susan X. Jane, if you want to just give a quick bio about you um, and, and introduce yourself. Oh, I think you're on mute, Susan. It's officially a Zoom call. I hit that uh -huh. center on bingo. Someone's on mute. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, and thanks to all of you for inviting me into your space. I really appreciate that. My name is Susan X. Jane. I am the principal of Navigators Consulting, and I am a trainer and diversity coach. And I also am a writer and blogger around issues of race and representation. Um, I am out here in the world trying to help people step into this moment and step into the work. Generally, prior to that, I was a media studies uh, instructor at Wheelock College. I was the director of the communications program there um, for many years. And prior to that, I worked in nonprofit and activism. And in all those different areas, I was looking at the intersection of race, media, and the way that we see ourselves and the world. So that's what brings me here to you today. And I'm sorry, I just got this dog an hour ago. So forgive the unprofessionalness of sleeping puppy. <laughs> or adorableness, we'll take it. <laughs> uh, Pooja, over to you. Thanks, Karen. And Susan, lovely to meet you as well. And this very, very cute puppy that I think we're all uh, happy that you are sharing with us today. Um, hello to Everyone on the line, thrilled to be here. My name is Pooja Jane Link. I'm an executive vice president at the Center for Talent Innovation, or CTI. Uh, we're a nonprofit think tank that does research and consulting on diversity and inclusion, uh, mostly focused in professional workplaces. And uh, we've been around for about 16 years. We put out two to three pieces of research every year. I co-lead our research arm. Uh, and you know, we focus uh, across the, the spectrum of diversity. So not just on gender or race, but also uh, generation, LGBTQ individuals, disability veterans, uh, you know, region, geography, uh, uh, a whole bunch of things. Uh, and then we also provide advisory services around that work uh, and, and partner with a community of about 75 companies to really drive action on the ground. Amazing. Well, 
Um, again, we're, we're so grateful to have you guys. And, and before we kind of kick off, um, which is some of the, the questions we want to throw, um, I just wanted to, to read this, this quote that I actually heard in an earlier She Says um, by Pride. And she was moderating um, an event earlier in Cape Town. Um, so again, very, very late for those guys. But she said something that kind of stuck with me and I thought really was, a, was an, a, an important sentiment to kick off today's discussion. She said, work is the place your hands get to show the world what you're about. So when you're discriminated against, and get, against at work, it can be the most painful. And I thought it was just really powerful um, when you really think about the lens of work and the role it plays, not only in, in our, in our you know, day to day careers, but in our identity and also in, in the abilities of what we have to put out into the world. Um, so obviously there's lots of conversation um, in society and social media, inside offices, talking about uh, racism and anti-racism at work. And you guys obviously, as you mentioned, both do a lot of, a lot of work um, and research in, in to different organizations that are really looking to change. Um, so we know it exists, it's there, um, it's been there. Um, and people uh, have tried to talk about it. So I, I, my first question to you guys, um, and I'll start with Pooja here is, how do you think that the conversation that you've been having um, within your organization or with other organizations has changed or shifted in the last few weeks? Yeah, a lot has shifted in the world in the last few weeks. And, uh, you know, especially with the conversations we are having with organizations, a lot of them are panicking to respond. You know, they want to talk about this, but they don't necessarily know how. Uh, and the people in our network, the people who work in corporate diversity and inclusion roles, they've been saying, you know, I've never been more popular, uh, but it's hard to still push push for action and get people to do things. You know, we published a study in December called Being Black in Corporate America. And the study took an intersectional lens in a way that you know, really hasn't been done before. Um, we looked at the nuances within the black experience in professional roles for people by gender, generation, region, LGBTQ identity, heritage. So the differences for Americans versus Afro-Caribbeans versus African, whether you were the first in your family to go to college, it's just a number of identities. And so we broke down this myth that there's a single black experience. And you know, white employees as members of the majority race, they're able to see themselves as individuals, but people of color are often seen as members of their race group. Uh, and many carry that burden. So, you know, if I fail, it'll be a failure for us all. And so, you know, our study help shine a light on the fact that there isn't a singular experience, uh, and that's really important, but nearly half the study focuses on solutions and a framework around how to take action, because it's you know time to stop talking about how hard things are and start doing something about them. And so, you know, kind of back to your question, when we published this research in December, we could not have anticipated how relevant the work would be today. So in our conversations now with organizations, many are referencing that solutions framework, referencing our primer on systemic racism and anti-racism, and they're looking for resources to really educate leaders and employees alike. Um, and so that framework for solutions is really crucial, but there's just such a reputational risk to get wrong that even though organizations are eager to act, uh, they're also scared to act. And so a lot of our talks today are really them asking how do we do this and how can we do it right away and you know what do we need to know because we clearly don't know it yet yeah and i i think uh already getting a few of these and i'm, I'm sure many more people are are wondering you know can we get a link to that study and i think to your point oh. about uh, i think people are, are clamoring for it i there was a i i think it was on, on code switch a couple of days ago they were saying how like now now more you know now the floodgates have opened and they're like we're like the gym after New Year's, but for racism, you know? And so I think there's, it's, it's great, but it's also can be very exhaustive, um, you know, to become this resource that is now suddenly very desired versus, versus what it was a few weeks ago, which has its own complexities. But Susan, curious for you too, how, how that conversation has really shifted um, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I think the conversation has been really fluid. Like I, I just kind of feel like, um, as we move through the first couple of days, we're different than the first week, we're different than the second week, the third week. And now um, to look back and to say it's, it has not yet even been 30 days uh, since the murder of George Floyd, it's remarkable to see what has happened in America. Um, 
And the conversations are a combination of both uh, deeply emotional. I think that we are in a moment um, first of, of deep grieving uh, for Black people about the continued loss of Black life and what that means writ large as this moment arrives. I think it brings with it um, all of the heaviness of history that we all experience um, in our day-to-day -day lives. And I think that's been very intense uh, for Black people in particular um, and more broadly for people of other diverse race groups because while oppressions are different we know that they're the weight of them is heavy and that they intersect and that there is is shared mourning and loss and pain in that um, and I think it's also a morning a moment of collective grieving for our country um, this has been an ex incredibly difficult period of time for our country the last 10 years, five years, uh, one year. Um, and, you know, I am quite sure on December 31st, we are all going to breathe a collective sigh of relief if we make it through this year. We saw the collapse of our public health system. We have seen now uh, kind of a, a real pushback to the narrative around um, injustice and police brutality. So, really, a kind of a, a collapse and a moment of reckoning for our justice system. We can feel out there that the economic system is um, kind of just hovering in the wings and we have a hard date for the election in November. So we really are seeing widespread systemic collapse in our country. And what that means for conversations is that people are interested in thinking systemically about what needs to happen now. And that's a real change. Um, before people really uh, would engage in racial dialogue or want to talk about how they felt or thought about race, but a little bit less about what they thought that they could personally um, do about it in their own um, homes and organizations. And I think that the attention on systemic racism has opened people up to exploring those things they can do to actually dismantle the system of power that keeps racism in place, um, no matter what we may feel about it. Yeah, yeah I mean, Oof. <laughs> like it's, I think, you know, I think that, I think the systemic nature is what, um, is what a lot of, a lot of after, you know, I, I love what you said about it being fluid, right? Because sometimes it feels like it hasn't been that many days and other times that you kind of think like, wow, it's only, it's been less than a month that this, that we've been kind of we're chatting. But I think the larger conversation is it hasn't been, it's been way longer than all of that time. And so I think that again, it's part of how we figure out as companies, um, how to really talk about and, and start to dissect some of these very layered systems that are, are not a one, a one quick fix. Um, and, and I'm curious for, for you guys, you know, as you started to talk to different companies or, you know, whether it's even from before, um, you know, the last couple of weeks, are there any examples either of, of, of a company or an organization that, that's caught your eye either from personal experience from working with, with that company um, or even just reading about it or kind of, you know, a press release here and there is, you know, it's really, there's a lot of conversations around who's getting it wrong. And I think that's very valid and, and warranted because that we have to learn from that too. But any, anybody who's getting it right, um, that, that kind of stands out to you and, and Susan, I'll, I'll throw it to you first. Mm, um, I feel like we're still early in the process to kind of know. I think it's it's easy to look and say, well, this is who's getting it wrong, because some people are really getting it wrong. Um, and the, I think the getting it wrong right now, the, the question really is, what is the level of authenticity and commitment to this going forward? And I feel like that still really remains to be seen. Um, I think, you know, I've been having some conversations with uh, Mullen Low and Media Hub, and just there is a real palpable commitment um, to thinking about this um, that was bubbling up before this incident. And so it is is supercharged that work. And, and people are coming to the table in ways that are really open um, and vulnerable and also committed to um, long term and also multi multi kind of part multi strategy ways of change. Um, and and, and I've seen that. I've also seen organizations that have used this moment to decide that this is not something that they're going to commit to, which is kind of an interesting thing to see as well. And so I feel like the, we have this moment of reckoning. Like I said, it's easy to see who's getting it wrong. It's great to see companies that are really leaning into that space in ways that feel really productive, um, really transformative. And time will tell how that plays out because we have other uh, is issues and situations that are coming at us. Um, but to be in the fight is is to, you know, uh, to be doing the battle. And we just take it each day. And if you're new to the fight, 
fight or old for the fight. To me, it doesn't matter because um, today is today. And so I'm really heartened to see people stepping into this space. A lot of people are getting it right um, just by saying that they're going to show up. What do you think, Pooja? Yeah, I think, Susan, that the words you said, that authentic commitment is so important. And we're kind of at the point where, you know, the public statement, the large donation, the town hall conversation, those are those are great. That's a, you know, an immediate response, but it's, you know, there's a lot of concern that, okay, that's just simply a performative response. You know, companies are doing this for the show and since their own internal representation, including especially at the leadership and board levels aren't, you know, there isn't that active reflection of diversity there that it's all just lip service to respond to the moment. Um, and the two things I've been seeing organizations do that, uh, you know, kind of suggest they may be willing to take on some of this introspective work about how to change is first, you know, setting up employee working groups to tackle this problem. And, you know, on its face, that's not a really novel or huge thing. Um, but I'd say the things that make it unique right now are the amount of thought and intention going into the composition of these groups. So having diversity, not just from that race perspective, but also gender, sexual orientation, business area, geography, you know, not having it all be people based at headquarters, really looking at all the facets of diversity and diverse thinking from an organization. And then I think the biggest key is that these groups are given a real budget and they report directly into a CEO or an executive committee. So they have that power to actually, you know, potentially drive real change. And it's also, you know, an opportunity for visibility for these folks who are joining this group to you know, advance their own careers. And then the second thing we've been seeing is, uh, you know, culture audits. And this is part of the work I lead at, or part of the work I lead at CTI, where we partner with organizations to do, you know, the same kind of work we do nationally in our research, but at the scope of a single organization. And so we work with organizations, HR teams, um, you know, that are already analyzing gaps in promotions and retention, and then we add to that data around the culture. Um, and so we're not just looking at those lagging factors around representation numbers, but really the leading factors. What's going on in the culture and how does it vary for employees of different races? Uh, and then report that again back to leaders to really share what they don't know, because a lot of times they are out of touch. Uh, you know, we worked with one company where we kind of presented, HR gave a presentation on hiring staff that showed a positive, positive trend. You know, oh, well, we're getting tons of new people of color in the door. Look at our numbers for black employees. Everything's great. And the CEO was like, all right, good. It seems like we're on track. And then our team kind of presented, well, here's what's going on, you know, once those folks are in the door. And he was like, never mind. <laughs> we have a huge problem and we really need to do something about it. And this kind of work, this, you know, deep data discovery I feel like it's so important because it can get you that buy-in around this problem isn't just nationally. It's not just happening outside our doors. It's here. It's we are part of the system contributing to this and we need to pay attention and do something about it. Mm. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think what, when you kind of talked about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the culture audits too, I think this again goes to, there's a lot of great initiatives happening, but, but what's the follow through and how, what's that accountability look like? And I think, We've been talking a lot and even kind of Susan touched on it of, you know, the, the, the marathon versus the sprint, you know, showing up is, is where we, where, you know, certain folks are beginning. Um, but, you know, somebody, somebody mentioned, one of my colleagues mentioned in a conversation the other day, um, you know, what happens when the Amazon masthead isn't featuring Black Lives Matter stories, you know, and, and I think that while everyone goes, yeah, yeah, I know, but I think, I, I guess a big question for me is what happens when, um, you know, how do we help um, keep companies that engaged um, and, 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 you know, really focused on those long-term changes because, again, we're seeing so much great commitment now, um, but as we know, businesses that have been flow. Um, and, I, and, I, and I wanted to, something that actually Susan said in, in, a, in a different chat that kind of stuck with me too was this idea of going from feeling things about racism this week to fixing things about racism long-term. That had really stuck with me because I think there's a lot of raw emotion um, there has been a lot of raw emotion before this started, but again, curious, Pooja, and your thoughts, even from as you guys counsel um, different boards, like how are you helping them with that long-term vision and, and what, you know, what kind of risk factors do you see being there for them to not follow through? Yeah, 
it's about pushing for the action. You know, everyone wants to act now. And so thinking about how to have that action be something that actually warrants the long-term response. So if, you know, you're working with a company and they're just fretting over, well, what's the statement we're going to put out? Or, you know, how do we teach our leaders how to have this conversation tomorrow? That's, that's not really enough. That's, that's in this moment. And so setting up the action now needs to warrant continual long-term engagement. And, you know, I mentioned the research we did, we put out this framework of, you know, something that all companies can take back and use to, to create solutions themselves, because it's not, you know, something off the shelf. It's not something that we can say, oh, well, here's the silver bullet. You all do it and you're good. Um, and we said, you know, it, we sort of had this, this three A's framework, audit, awaken, act, and saying, you know, that audit piece that I just mentioned, you, you need to understand your own culture and your own numbers and the data of what's going on within your walls, and then use that to fuel and it's funny we said awaken then because again now there's so much conversation about this national awakening that's happening and so uh you know we said it's important to awaken employee bases and to start with introspection have employees you know you, you can't give everyone a race theory 101 course but you can give them access to resources that can help elevate their thinking and allow them to do some of that introspective work in private alone on their own privilege and the power that they may have had in their life that's helped them. And then, you know, from introspection move to conversation where they're starting to have some of that dialogue first within safe spaces before moving across lines of race. Mm -hmm. um, and then once people can actually engage in this conversation and do so really authentically and genuinely, then act, you know, that's when you can start to pull people together to build solutions. And again, it's so important not to have solutions that um, are, you know, being owned solely by the black employees at the company. We've heard so many times, you know, employee resource groups will say, oh, well, we surface these problems and then are told to solve for them ourselves. This is something that everyone, the collective needs to pick up and try and do. Um, and if there's a fourth A, we wish we'd have added to this framework, it would have been accountability having accountability measures, having this tracked, having um, people really take ownership of it and have there be a negative consequence for if goals aren't met is crucial. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do, I love that audit, awaken, act. Um, and I think it, it, it's great for kind of the, the larger sphere of an organization, but equally, if not more important for every individual. And I'd love to dig into kind of the individuals, right? Because the workplace is obviously has a leadership structure, but it's also made up of a, t a ton of humans. Um, and, you know, you said something earlier, Pooja, that I thought was like, uh, you know, white people think of themselves as unique and others as part of a group. And I think that's like some of these things we really have to tackle head on because as an, that's coming to a workplace as well. Um, and I, I, you know, some of some some of these kind of different facts or stats that are are not surprising yet surprising when you really sit with it um you know that the 75 percent of white people have entirely all white friend groups and when i heard that i was like yeah i'm not surprised by that but then when i really like sat with it and thought like oh my god like what what is that what is, like what the what that does and what that does within a workplace um intentionally or unintentionally um is is really is is really scary. And so I, I, um, I'd be curious, you know, what do you guys think are some of the small kind of individual behavior changes that um, companies can be encouraging for employees? Um, whether, you know, again, we've heard a lot of kind of research and, and, and learn your own things, but especially keeping the workplace in mind, um, knowing that there are so many uh, different ways that we can influence both positively and negatively our peers. Um, and Susan, I'd be curious your thoughts on just the individual steps for, for all folks. I think this step, that, and, and I think that you already alluded, alluded to this, Pooja, I think one of the steps that we like to skip over is a reflection and really coming to our own reckoning of what's happening. I know for um, the last month, the number one question has been like, but what do I do? I know, but what do I do? And we have to put down the idea that we are going to do something and therefore the problem will be resolved and back up to a place where we are reflective and asking those hard questions. Um, a lot of times we ask questions rhetorically or we ask questions thinking that, um, that black, indigenous and people of color will be the people that will step in and help us to answer that. So when someone is like, well, you know, we don't have any diversity at the leadership, so what should I do? And I think the first step is to do that individual work to say, 
all right, I, I might have some feelings about that, but now let me actually think about it. how did it get here? How did this happen? What was, what was my role and my responsibility um, and where are my opportunities to do something about it? I think that um, we think of race, uh, we are often encouraged to think of race at the, at the personal level and about how we feel about it and not really think about the way that power manifests in our individual lives. In, in every interaction that we have, there are power dynamics at play. And race is a social construct that was purposely created to manipulate those power dynamics to conserve power for some people and not others. And I think that it's important to say that. So at the individual level, I, I can say that in one sentence. Sit with that. What does that mean? What does that mean for you as you go through the next week or two weeks and you're going to church or you're going about your daily business, your friend group, and you're like, why are, not so much why are there no people of color there, but what is happening with, with me and people in my community that we are creating this kind of community? And I think that's a really different framework from, you know, let's ask people of color what the problem is to saying, what am I doing? What am I actually manufacturing um, with the power that I have? And that is, that really is just thinking and it's metacognating, thinking about your thinking. And everybody wants a book or a movie, but inside of you is the only person that can really dig into your own lived experiences and thoughts and ideas to really challenge yourself to think differently. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, I'm, and I think one of the things that gets so challenging about that, the most important step, because it is so inward, back to kind of if there was a fourth A, it's like, how do we hold people accountable for that? And, and as an organization, what, you know, what, if anything, can organizations do to try to help facilitate um, that exact sentiment that you just expressed? Because it is so personal um, and, and it is kind of, it is something that is going to affect how people show up to do the job that they were hired to do. Um, and I'm curious, Pooja, if you have any thoughts of, you know, is what that accountability could look like on a personal level, especially for something, you know, the, the most important step, which is kind of that inward, inward reflection. Yeah, I want to just build on what Susan said and say, you know, um, systemic oppression is so linked to that uneven distribution of power. And so if you really want to be anti-racist, think about how you can give away some of your own privilege. So not just how you use your power to lift others up, but actually how do you give away your power? Because you, you have it, someone else doesn't. And so if we're trying to dismantle these systems of inequity, and really create, uh, you know, justice. It's we all have access. We all have this power, and the uneven distribution is just is the challenge. I mean, again, I think as Susan said, that's you really have to sit and think about that. It's not something you can take up and do tomorrow. And so, again, like I think we are all very quick to want to act, and there is a lot of thinking that has to go into this. I mean, just. And the individual actions, you know, the small thing is when you see something happening that isn't right, call it out. And again, I mean, this is at least in terms of using your, your privilege or your power on behalf of others, you know, it shouldn't always be up to the person who is the recipient of a microaggression or biased behavior to have to stand up for themselves. Others should be doing it. Um, you know, allyship isn't a hashtag, it's, it's more active and involved. So figuring out how you can do that, um, wherever you sit and whatever your current position is, you know, uh, and I don't mean position just professionally, but in the world who you are and who you exist as, um, figuring out what is, what is, is your role. I, I will say, I mean, I, as someone who works in this, who has conversations about this day in and day out, I have in the past month had a lot of reflection on my own my own privileges and what is what are some of the ways in which I have opted out. I mean, that I think is the greatest privilege that I, I sit with is the ability to opt out of certain experiences or conversations. And so thinking about ways where I hold myself accountable to not letting myself off the hook and, and you know, saying others do not have that luxury, why should I? Right, right, yeah, I mean, I think we, Privilege has obviously been a, a, a big topic um, as, as people are hopefully um, reflecting across, you know, on, on just kind of what, what are, what's happening in our, in our workplace. And I think that um, what is really, I think, again, there's, there's just the things that are, are seemingly kind of obvious to many and, and not to all. And I think 
starting to kind of come to these conversations with like, let's just, let's just state these things though, because we're, we're assuming a lot. Um, and I think, you know, when, especially when it comes to privilege, I think one of the biggest um, eye, opener, eye openers for some is that, you know, many, most, many and most white people never have to talk about race. It's a, it's a choice to your point, um, opting in or opting out. And I think that, um, I think at, at, at the workplace, you know, I think that's part of what I'm kind of really curious about as we figure out how to kind of make sure that this conversation becomes a sustained one versus a, because there, there will be a point where opting out starts to kind of trickle in. And I think that, um, you know, I think again, that's gonna go back to some of these, what are these individual trends? And, and I'm curious if, you know, obviously we, in many discussions, unconscious bias, microaggressions are kind of these, in, you know, these, these moves that are happening by many individuals. Sometimes they're aware, sometimes they're not. But, you know, as we, you know, for this group that's kind of obviously here to, to learn and talk about how to create that anti-racist workplace, are there really common um, or kind of the, the 101, like what kind of uh, unconscious um, bias or microaggressions from your experience in just recent chats with companies um, or individuals are, should people really be on the lookout for to make sure that they're calling out either in themselves or in, among other people or kind of what are some of the most egregious um, or just some examples because they're all very egregious that are kind of contributing to a, a toxic workplace. Um, and Susan, I'll, I'll throw it to you. Um, I feel like, I, I think that there is a lot of attention these days to the idea of unconscious bias and microaggressions. Um, and I think it's really helpful for be people to begin to think about what is my thinking about this? Um, I like to get rid of the unconscious because you also have conscious bias as well. And I think one of the challenges with unconscious bias is it's unconscious. So you cannot surface it to your consciousness to address it. There's no action for you to take with unconscious bias. We all have it. And it is our conscious biases, it is our lived experiences, our values, beliefs, and norms that really we are acting out like, you know, like players in a play. We learn things as we are socialized and then we act those things out. And so, you know, I think that starts us off with a like, ooh, okay, so I have to think about my biases because they are kind of rotating around in there. Um, if you live in an environment where you only see people of one race, um, you can see that, you know, and that is going to be at a conscious level. And while you may not think about it, um, you know, you could also think about when was the last time I was in a place where I was the only person of my race with one or 200 people? How did I feel? What was that like? And so we can, we can become more aware so that we can bring that level of consciousness to our own life to be able to examine our biases. And microaggressions, the most common ones are really just not being able to see people as whole human beings um, by slicing them up in little places um, or by comparing people to our idea of what people of a particular race are and then letting them know that they are different or the same. Oh, you're, you know, you're really, your hair looks really beautiful for someone that has, you know, um, really pretty hair. I used to get that when, uh, before the natural hair movement or, or saying like, oh, you're so well-spoken. Even things that can seem really kind, what you're saying is I see a difference between the structure of race that I have in my head and how you are showing up. And so it's kind of like this death of a thousand cuts. And I think that it's, it's a part of, it's relational violence. It's the it's nice things that we may say to people that may let them know I see you as an other I don't you see you as a part of my in group. Um, and so I think learning about that can help to get at it. And then they come out in all of these ways. And it's hard to put, pick them out because anyone I say, you're going to say, oh, well, what's wrong with that? You know, um, I went to a doctor's appointment. This was just a, a few months before COVID. And the uh, doctor came into the doctor's room, went, took her hand and went like this to my hair and goes, well, isn't that fun? And I was like, okay and she also had a big needle that she was going to inject into my knee so i was like okay i don't want you to um put that needle in my knee um now that we have had this interaction and it, there was nothing that she meant by it she was trying to say something that was kind but what she was doing was was emphasizing difference and otherness as separate from her and her own experience and that's what makes people feel like there's distance between us mm. I'm still thinking about the story, but um, uh, Pooja, I, I, you know, curious for you if there are any kind of examples that stand out. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, 
Susan, you summed it up really well and really explained microaggressions um, perfectly. Uh, in that study, you know, I mentioned uh, on, on Black professionals, you know, we found in our data that there were 14 microaggressions uh, that Black employees were more likely to experience than colleagues of all other races. And that was of a limited list. I mean, 14, you know, when we first saw it, we're like, that's a lot. And then we're like, there's so much more that should be on this list. You know, it included things like being called angry or articulate or having someone touch your hair without your permission. Um, and that was the only one we found a gender difference in. Black men were, of course, more likely to experience that than Black men. Uh, otherwise, they were equally likely to experience everything else. It also, you know, in the context of the workplace, includes things like being passed over uh, for growth opportunities um, for, for reasons that are less than clear. And, you know, there's a lot of, we talk about bias, I think there's a lot of talk of unfair advantages. And, you know, a lot of times when I meet with leaders about this, they're saying, oh, well, you know, this is all great, but I'm not comfortable doing anything outside of a meritocracy. And what I always have to say back is, what makes you think that your organization is a meritocracy? You know, um, we all, you know, very openly acknowledge how much relationships and networks matter. Uh, no one disagrees on that. Um, it's also fairly well established that we all hold bias. You know, the very common saying, if you have a brain, you have bias. Uh, it's just sort of how we learn as we develop as human beings. Um, and now in this current moment, people are starting to see, really see and start to understand some of the systemic challenges that favor certain groups over others. So workplaces are not meritocracies and we need to throw out these ideas that building equity is somehow unfair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, I think what's, one of the things still kind of sticking with me too is just the, the idea of how, you know, consciously, unconsciously, I, I, yeah, I love the word, just let's get rid of unconscious because let's be honest, you know, it's happening um, and it almost kind of gives permission for it, it to be, it's like, you know, to be okay. But I, I think the idea of when we look at the individuals within our workplace or uh, in our network, kind of slicing them up um, and, and not really being able to be a whole human being. I think when, especially when we look at, you know, how we expect or now suddenly hope for black employees to now, you know, come be your full self at work when up until a few weeks ago, we weren't ever talking about this ever so explicitly. And, I, and I'd be curious, you know, either in conversations about, you know, there, there's kind of this, I, I was talking to, to some friends a couple of weeks ago and it's like, you know, we've, you know, she was mentioning like, you know, we, I was chatting with a colleague, you know, we've been, we've been code switching for so long. Now we're not supposed to, like, I don't really understand like how the, the switch doesn't turn like that. And so I'd be, I'd be curious to you guys of how do you, you know, even encourage, you know, those who are, are struggling with like, I don't really know how to shift this fast or like, is, am I, am I really, is, is the company really ready for what they say they want? Um, and, you know, which is the full breadth of talent, you know, how are, how are we helping um, those who are either saying that they want people to show up and or those who feel like they truly can't show up in, in a workplace that isn't, isn't really ready for their, the full, their full offerings. Uh, Susan, I'll throw it to you. Uh, you know, I think that uh, people don't show up with their whole self at work because they do not feel like it is safe, because they have witnessed in various contexts that there are consequences associated with their behavior, that their behavior may be racialized, people apply bias and prejudice to it, and then use their power to enforce consequences. That is kind of the textbook definition of racism, is using your power and privilege to be able to act behavior, act out on a prejudice that you might have. Um, and so that's the reason that people aren't bringing their whole selves to work. Um, and again, we can invite, um, for instance, Black employees in to be their whole self. And in order for that to actually work long term, we need to say, what is happening in the culture that is making people feel unsafe? And how do we address that through equi equitable practices and policies, and also through uh, relationship management? Um, because we're talking about relational uh, dynamics, and we are also talking about how we enforce those relational dynamics in the business's uh, codes of practice and behavior. So, you know, in order to kind of get people to show up at their whole self is, at work, we need to unpack what is already happening in the culture. I think, it, as we just said so eloquently, like, let's look at the culture and not just jump to action, but to say, what is it? You know, I've been using the analogy of, you know, a body that wants a transplant. You have to not only go and procure 
what you want to bring into your body, but the body has to be prepared, it has to be healthy, it has to be ready, and it has to be accepting of that transplant. And at some point, we want to get to a point where we're not bringing them in, but we're building a new space that we actually are sharing. Um, and that uh, can be challenging in long-term work, but that's the kind of work that will make people feel like they can show up as their whole self. The same thing that would make any of us feel like they could show up at their whole self. If you show up and you get your hand slapped, you are less likely to feel like you should be at the party. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Pooja, anything to add? I would just say, yeah, that, uh, you know, when it comes to authenticity, even the folks who, in our research, we found people who say that they are, you know, and especially um, black professionals who say they are able to be authentic at work, it, you know, our data reveals that it still, it takes more energy for them to be authentic at work. And so that mask, even when it slowly comes off, you know, the arm is still holding it there. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. this very interesting experience that, um, I think signals the, not just that experience of the bias or the lack of safety, but also that you are not fully welcome and included, you're not heard and recognized. You know, there's so much research, especially on black women and how their ideas and contributions go overlooked. And, uh, you know, there are, there are behaviors that leaders and peers can do about giving credit, about recognizing ideas, um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard the, the story about you know, the, the black woman who, who speaks up in a meeting, says something, and I mean, this honestly happens to many women of all races, but you know, a few minutes later, a guy says it, and, and it's the greatest thing ever, and it's so frustrating. Um, and there's, you know, there's that experience, there's the subtle comments questioning whether you belong, whether you're qualified, um, there's also the straight up mistakes where you show up somewhere and it's assumed you're the caterer, not the keynote speaker. Melody Hobson has a great story about that. Uh, and so it's, it's, some of it is questioning also people's that first instinct. Uh, why can't they assume that, you know, the black woman when she shows up at the meeting is there to lead it? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I the, the, just the visual kind of metaphor of even when the mask comes down, you know, the, the arm is still there holding it. I think that, so many, so many of these powerful kind of metaphors and visuals, I think, are helping people go, oh, God, like, yeah, yeah, you're right. And, um, and I think that is super important as, as for kind of these reflective tools as we are reflecting is like being able to kind of harken back to some of these um, and really remember um, a lot of the different discussion. Uh, I want to ask you guys one, one more question before we open it up to uh, audience questions. And, and this is kind of looking forward. I mean, again, a lot of this, you know, as we've been having this discussion, we know this is not a new discussion. We look at back at our history in so many moments in time, um, back you know decades, back you know generations. Um, what what do you think uh, we'll say about this moment in time, um, fifty years from today? Uh, if we were you know reflecting back, you know, is it something that would be a a culture shift? Is it kind of another blip that will then fizzle out? Is it is is there massive change? Um, and I'd just be curious kind of uh, your thoughts on that. And Pooja, I'll start with you. I mean, I think we will definitely say the world changed. How it changed is, you know, yet to be seen. My hope is that, you know, to some extent, these systems and institutions in place get broken down fully and, and rebuilt as something new and something fair and equitable and beautiful, but uh, that's my hope of what happens. Uh, my optimism levels have yet to be determined on whether we will create that future. Um, and I think all of us, you know, in our personal lives most likely are coming up against individuals, colleagues, family members, friends who are at various levels, uh, various points in the spectrum of, of views here. You know, we live in such a polarized world um, and just working within those spheres of influence that we have to, to create that world that we hopefully uh, want to will into existence. I think now is the moment where that will happen and, and who knows. Yeah, definitely. How about you, Susan? What do you think 50 years from today? Um, yeah, this is a moment like 2020. Like remember when you were like 2020, I mean, it's gonna be clear vision. Well, you can see now, you know, so. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I, I, I feel deeply like 2020 is whispering to us every day, evolve, evolve, evolve. 
Mm. Because if we don't evolve, we've already seen that it is untenable to continue down the pathway that we are. Um, you know, the, the statistics just are not on the side of white supremacy. It's an increasingly diverse world. Uh, you, you know, people are, are connecting in solidarity across lines that they haven't in a long period of time. Um, and kind of to the thought about are things going to change, I can say that for myself personally and many Black people I know, like, we're not going back. We're not going back. So it's either, you know, I, I, there's a, a quote from Tupac where he says, you know, there's not going to be no more play, you know, and I think that it is this idea that, that this is a moment. Now, I, I agree with Pooja, now how we step to it, that still remains to be seen. Um, but the thing is that I think we're seeing that systems are failing everybody. And when we start to really see that the system of white supremacy does not work for um, black people in particular and people of color writ large, it also does not work for white people because the system that was supposed to protect you from COVID used racism as a way to opt out from doing what was right from public health. Uh, the system of the economy chose to tap out rather than stepping in to really help everybody with this idea that it's marginalized people that bear the brunt and they are expendable. Um, we are now deeply aware that, um, the, that we are all essential to make this culture work if we were to have the kind of rich culture that we want. So we may or may not make this moment uh, into something magical. And, and I will just share this, like, I am generally a hopeful person. And I was on the phone with a friend last week weeping, like just, we were all just openly weeping. Um, and then I said, you know, I was like, well, you know, we have to keep fighting, but you know, you're never going to see the end of racism in your lifetime, but that, that is the, is the, the role is that you have to pick up the chain of history and carry it to the next thing. And then when I was uh, laid down to sleep that night, a little voice in my head said, well, maybe. <laughs> I never said maybe before. I feel maybe now. I, hey, we'll take that. We'll take that yeah, little voice. Yeah. I think that maybe, little voice is maybe where we it's all a big difference. Be. Absolutely, maybe it's a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, a huge, huge, huge thanks to both Susan and Pooja um, for amazingly, um, just as always, kind of wonderful anecdotes, intelligence, answers. Um, we have a few, a few more minutes. I'd love to open it up to um, to the audience. Um, and if you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat, or if you'd like to ask it yourself, um, just throw your name in the chat and we can let you ask these guys directly. So any questions for, for Susan and Pooja? Don't be shy, they say smart things. All right, Tari Cash. Oh, you gotta go off mute, yeah. I will, I will ask a question and, and just share some, some comments. This was so eloquent and I just appreciate both of you, all three of you so, so much. Um, I want to share something that's very personal to my situation, which is that I am amongst um, the group of African-American women that have left corporate America and started my own business because I don't think I gave up. I'll say it like that. I quit because it was too much. It was too much to deal with the microaggressions, to deal with the, uh, the way that I was treated, to get overlooked. And I have, you know, keep some people on this, on this uh, Zoom. No, I, I've got some incredible credentials. Like I deserve to be there with the best of them, but I couldn't hang and, and I threw in the towel and, and I'm proud of myself. And now I have my own business and we are, um, we are growing and it's a grind. So one sort of plea is I think black women are amongst the fastest group of entrepreneurs out there. Um, I think like 89, 90%. And my hypothesis is that we're tired you know, it, corporate America didn't work for us. So now we're doing our own things. So if you're looking for a way to get involved, go support, <laughs> whether it is help them with marketing or help them with strategy, help us, I should say, help us with 
finance help us grow our businesses because we are hiring other um, black and white professionals. And I think we are creating environments that are a bit more equitable than some of the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies that are out there. So that's kind of my plea. My question, I think, is um, to both of you, since you're so eloquent, uh, again, a very personal situation that I'm experiencing is I have a lot of incredible white friends and people around me that just want to talk and they want, I almost feel like they're looking for me to be like, to, to, to give them permission to feel how they're feeling. And sometimes I just don't know how to respond. I, I did an interview the other day where this guy was like saying how angry he was about racism. <laughs> and I, I, I was like looking at him and I just didn't have the words to offer him. I didn't know what to say. So because I am a believer in creating the safe spaces for people that want to have this conversation and I and I want to be an ally to my dear dear friends that are reckoning and struggling with this but I'm not exactly sure what my role is uh, in this conversation right now as someone that is truly just exhausted um, exhausted by the conversation quite frankly can if you're available i'd like to offer something to you okay. you said in your own story of your journey that you couldn't hang and you had to and you and you left you you got up because love was no longer being served that's not can't hang that's like don't want it's like yeah. i'm not doing it anymore and i think that you know there is this other danger is that as we think about you know corporate america all right how do we begin to engage in diversity this is not the first round and people have a right to say you know what i'm not doing it anymore and that uh, you have every right to set boundaries um, in the workplace and to, to give yourself permission, um, as, as the saying goes, to get up from the table when love is no longer being served. And, and I have to say, I've been in situations that have been very difficult where I feel looking back like I stayed way longer than I should have because it was this idea of like, I gotta hang, I gotta hang. And it's like, don't have to hang. It's, that's, that's madness. Like it's toxicity and you have the choice to say no. And I think in terms of supporting people, especially now as we're still like really early on in this, um, we all have to make space for our own feelings. And I think that it can be very difficult to have those cross-cultural communication when people are just coming to it and there is such a, a, a well of exhaustion and pain and grieving that is already in your life. And, you know, I think it's helpful to say, I really care about you. I want to support you. But right now, like, I'm just not available for emotional labor because I'm really trying to take care of myself to keep myself balanced. And, and I want to be there for you. And I really support your learning. Um, and I'll be available as soon as I feel like I really am in a good place with that. Um, and just to, to tell people, people may have not heard the term of emotional labor to understand that that is how people of color experience those conversations sometimes because we're not necessarily meeting in the same place. We're meeting in different places um, and where people are, I, I think we need a word other than exhausted because I, I, I know that feeling that you feel and it is something not enough sleep in the universe will will do that. It is hurt. It is it is wounded deeply. And we need to be able to say, I'm going to make space to heal. And sometimes that means not crossing the line to help other people understand um, what that experience is going to be like for them. Mm. Mm. I'll just, and I think that was really well said, Susan, and I'll just add a very small thing. One, Tari, the you know, in our research, we actually looked at exactly what you said, how many black professionals are opting out. We found that for black women, I think it was something like one in six black women currently in corporate America are considering leaving to start their own venture. So it is a huge population. You are not alone. And uh, I'll just echo Susan's uh, sentiments that, you know, take care of yourself. Uh, do, you know, it is not your responsibility, your job to educate others. I, I think it's great that you want to support and in the time where you can do so, but you know, there is such a thing as overextending and extend yourself to the ability that you want and you can. And for the times you can't, you could, you know, you could have a, a one sheet on here, here. Here are things you can read, you can watch, you can listen to. Um, actually, you know, we have, I can send you a one sheet that is like, 
you want to learn, here are things you can go read, watch, listen to, experience that are not me. And maybe once you've done all of that work, we can talk again. And you'll come to that conversation in a position, you know, in a place where you might actually be able to support me rather than me supporting you. And I, and there was, um, Google it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. They'll, they'll be okay. Um, but I think in, for, there was a lot of head nods as Tari started talking and the question about, you know, wh what is your business? There's links in there. So you can uh, check out what Tari does. You can also donate to what Tari does. You can share it with your friends about what Tari does. Um, and she does, the, the business does have a really incredible, um, just a shout out, is a really incredible program called Backing Birdies that's all about um, trying to bring um, under, underserved communities into the game of golf, which is a historically not very diverse place. So if you like golf or just like the idea of exposing people to new experiences, um, you can check it out. And on the website, you can buy some, some tickets for Backing Birdies. So lots of good things to share, even um, from Tari's question. Um, one, one, another question we have um, in, the, in the chat here um, is, uh, as someone looking for jobs in the midst of, a sh uh, of this shift in awareness and action, there are, specific, some, are there specific company d &I programs or initiatives you've seen coming down the pipeline that we should be considering as new employees and watching more closely long-term to make sure companies are being authentic and not just meeting, their, meeting or beating a KPI? What should we actively be looking for going in? Great question. I can, I can start. This is a simple one. You know, our company is publishing their diversity numbers. Um, no one has good numbers. So I wouldn't say look for the place that has great numbers. You're not going to find it. Um, but if they are willing to be transparent, then they are, they, then they have acknowledged, we know it's not great, but we are going to change and we have to because we've put ourselves publicly on the hook. Um, so how easy is it to find those numbers? You can, I think you should look at what do they look like, and especially as you go up in level, they, you know, are they, sh are they sharing it by level? Are they sharing the breakdown? Um, that would be one thing to look for. Another would be any comments they've made on pay equity. There are a number of companies that are doing pay equity analysis and pretty public about it. There are a number that are not uh, public about it, but that are still actively engaged in that work. Um, so those would be two, two um, easy metrics. I don't think they reflect the current moment, and I just I don't know what it is to look for in terms of that, but I would say just as a general rule of thumb, companies are putting themselves publicly on the hook, then they're, they're probably going to take some action. Oh, Susan, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. There's squeaking happening in the back here. Um, I think that um, one thing to think to, that you can do is just to listen really carefully to where their language is at. Language tends to be the leading edge of, uh, of social movement. So, uh, and as I'm sure all of you are really experienced, the language is rapidly evolving. Um, and as someone that was teaching, it's, it's moving all the time. And so, you know, we used to say diversity, then it was equity, then it's inclusion. Those are all different things. So listen for the language. And if somebody is like, you know, we really, uh, we're, we're concerned about recruiting and they're only thinking about pipeline stuff. Yeah. Or if the diversity lives only in HR. You know, if they're, if they, if when you say the word anti-racist, they glaze over. Um, just kind of those, those can be a bellwether of where the thinking is at, because as you evolve of your thinking, your language will evolve to help you describe new ways of, of cognating. Great, very well said. Um, and uh, I, I thought this was a great comment here in the in the chat. It, it isn't fair for white privilege to want the cliff notes. The learning takes time and effort. And I think um, that definitely um, sums up a lot of what we've been talking about of kind of the, a journey really starting with that introspection um, being super, super important. Um, so thank you guys so much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Pooja. We appreciate you so, so much for taking the time. And thank you all for joining. Um, and we hope to see you at the next uh, She Says Boston, which I believe is uh, July 15th, but you'll get, a, you'll get an email about it. And we hope to see you guys all there. Yay. Thank you all for having thank me so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all.